entity in Bangladesh. Uh, it's related to uh, the hearing impaired uh, effort that my father had started about eight, nine years ago. He had uh, he passed away in 2015, so I went. I made a trip in 2015 to figure out uh, what activities that he was involved in, and I'm trying to pick it up and found an opportunity where uh, we could potentially um, uh, help through uh, Rotary, and so I'm here to talk about that. Uh, what is Shahik? It's a voluntary uh, entity and focused on children with uh, hearing impairment issues, as well as uh, uh, in general, people, uh, adults with similar problems. So the thing is, uh, where is Bangladesh or where is this specific uh, non-profit located? And uh, you can see it's in a small port city on the southeastern coastline of Bangladesh next to its big brother, India. I'm not sure if anyone has uh, visited or been in that Area, but it is the home of the largest mangrove forest in the world that was the last few thousand Bengal tigers that are still around. That's a 10 minute view. So, uh, this organization is focused on uh, the uh, ear, nose, and throat uh, patients, and to give a a quick update: uh, We have a lot of children with these uh, with these uh, uh, medical issues, and unfortunately, there isn't a very uh, well-established uh, set of facilities that address this early at the early stages. And a lot of these young kids sometimes get left out of the general. Uh, education system and once they miss a few classes they can never get back and so one of the objectives of this organization is to provide the early detection and uh, services where they could help these kids reintegrate into the normal school. Uh, this uh, particular building, I have some pictures later, has, uh, is already built out with three floors now and has uh, five classrooms uh, Two of the three of them are fully operational. The other two are being built out. It's like a one-stop shop. The kids who come in from the front gate, they get an early assessment. Uh, they figure out if they need uh, surgery or some other type of uh, more complicated uh, procedure, or if it's some sort of a therapy. And based on that, they're assigned to the right classroom, or they get assigned for uh, a medical treatment. There's a nominal fee more for having uh, uh, some, I guess, uh, sense of um, uh, involvement with the parents or whoever they are. That this is a, you know, it's really more about uh, administrative than uh, anything that covers uh, the, uh, the overall uh, operations. Uh, this was a picture. Uh, I took in 2015, I went back, it's been, it was just fully painted, uh, this has two floors. Right now I hear that the third floor is also completed. It has a very, very nice land, a lot of room for uh, growth and uh, a very nice building overall. Uh, so it says here, you can see Chilagong sub-center of Shahi. The reason why it says sub-center is uh, Shahi is the specific one in this small city is a sub-organization <clears throat> sub, uh, of the, uh, uh, the overall Shahid that is in the capital city. That's a very large organization, the only one in Bangladesh that has a fully functional hospital. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to point out that uh, we had Dr. Jackie Clark attend uh, Rotary, she gave a presentation of her global footprint in uh, ENT research and uh, projects. And she, as a coincidence, was already working with the capital city, Shahik, uh, US representative. And so we all got connected. 
And uh, we've been working with Dr. Clark a lot in terms of the certification programs that are vital to build up the local uh, expertise in the technicians as well as the therapists uh, in, in the site. Some of the overall objectives. <clears throat> so I mentioned that they are focused on early detection. And uh, I think I touched on most of these points. Uh, the, uh, one of the key issues here, again, is to help these young children uh, get through this process of reintegration. Because I uh, wanted to stress again, if they miss one or two classes, it's almost impossible. There's no there's no infrastructure in the society to help them get, uh, catch up with the system, and it's so competitive. It's a survival of the fittest in the education system. There are hundreds of thousands of graduates every year. They're competing with each other. Everybody's trying to get in the one percent, and you really have to uh, have you know you can't be uh, you can't have these other challenges in your life to slow you down. So. That's why early detection and uh, helping them overcome these uh, uh, impairments is critical. A couple of the strategic or more long-term focus I touched upon, the requirement and the and necessity to uh, grow the local talent, whether it's uh, speech therapists or technicians that can manage some of the more complicated uh, <clears throat> equipment, the audio meters are fairly complex electronic equipment. Uh, so they, they are various certification programs. Dr. Clark has identified a couple. The one year program about eight hundred dollars or six hundred dollars. I think we have enough funds potentially to fund one or two uh, uh, technicians. Uh, I think that's um, that's going on to the Next slide, a few more pictures. Uh, this is the front entrance, just to give you a sense of uh, how much land there is between that white building I showed you earlier and the gate. Uh, so we, it could, uh, there's a lot of room for expansion, children's playground and all of that. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we have five classrooms today and uh, potential to grow. My father was a forensic accountant, and his support for this organization was really operational, financial management, tax, auditing, and all that. And uh, just a picture of him sitting down here. And the person here is Dr. Ali. He's currently running this. He's also a surgeon and uh, uh, running this. And he's also the past Rotary president of the RCC, the Rotary Chittagong Club. Uh, there's a new president now. Uh, but uh, it's it, it's nice that he's already integrated, he's aware of the infrastructure, how it works. So I hope you know this will uh, provide an opportunity to, to for uh, future collaboration. I sat in a few of the classes. Uh, this is a speech therapy class, and uh, one of the things that my mother was here with me. Uh, one of the things that is remarkable, and it's difficult to comprehend unless you've been into some of these facilities, is the level of excitement that you get from these young kids when they hear themselves for the first time in a uh, speech that's legible, that they can understand. They jump out of this chair in, <laughs> in, in excitement. That is, that, is that me talking? And uh, simple sentences that they get to construct and repeat, they just, you know, they're overjoyed. So some of these very simple things in life that we uh, saw ubiquitous for us is a life-changing experience for these children. And they have this sense of, I want to run back to class to catch up with the rest of the students. Because I understand the concepts, I just can't communicate. So they're very competitive because they know what they're missing out. Uh, so it's very exciting to uh, be there. So a couple of things that they're working on. Um, there are two professors, there are two teachers on speech therapy. Uh, so we have this preschool assessment, trying to figure out where they fit in. There are teachers there to test their level, skill set. Uh, we have three grades of classes that uh, the students are assigned to, to help them uh, reintegrate. Uh, there's an audio meter 
audiometrics uh, lab that uh, we have one technician who's uh, certified the rest. We really need them to uh, get some training. Uh, that uh, you know, we have a long line of kids every morning. They just go through this and they wear the headphones and they get assessed, they get a report, that report goes to the surgeon. They <clears throat> can then decide uh, do they need uh, surgery or some speech therapy or something else, maybe some cochlear uh, implants and things like that. And there's also a class to assess the molds required for any particular type of uh, hearing aids that may not fit the standard ones that we can buy or get uh, locally. And then, of course, more sophisticated medical treatment for any particular ENT type diseases that are outsourced to the main center in the capital, where you have a large hospital and a lot of doctors. And we, when I went in 2015, the surgery room was being uh, finished out right now, from what I understand, it's operational. Uh, they have everything except for an ENT surgical microscope. And that was one of the key items for this grant that we submitted. Uh, we have constantly uh, a constant set of kids and adults in the hearing test rooms. Uh, the audio meter room got completed, so it has all these walls with those um, foamy type equipment to maintain the decibel levels at a point where the equipment can be very accurate. Uh, so this was uh, the pre uh, audio room that's now functional. We have teachers, speech therapists, uh, the surgery, surgical, surgical room, the operating, uh, cochlear uh, type of treatment, hearing aids. The hearing aids are, um, that's a picture, it's very old fashioned. Uh, in some future date, we hope to get uh, more modern equipment out there funded. Uh, the presentation that we saw from uh, Chris uh, a few, several weeks ago on this trip to Guerrero, uh, uh, yeah. Chiapas or Guerrero? Yeah, Guerrero. Yeah, yeah. uh, this is at a much smaller scale, but something that Shahid does throughout. They are trying to go to Nepal as well, but they have these little boot camp type of things. They set up a tent, they have a lot of uh, doctors pro bono come and trying to do these uh, preliminary assessments, quick testing of uh, the quality of uh, the hearing uh, impairment issues that they see. Uh, it's a little bit ad hoc, but with the right level of skill set, we could make this a little more formalized and start you know, scaling to various cities and villages, even outside of the country. Uh, so every day, there are dozens of kids in the line. This is all. So there's a typo here it's since 2013. Uh, just some rough estimates on the number of people. So it's a lot of kids out there, a lot of opportunities to help. I think this is the final two slides. Where do we want to go with this? It's uh, really to expand the current uh, facilities, uh, the operating theater, adding the equipment to improve the throughput of the uh, uh, kits that go through. Right now, there are a lot of bottlenecks throughout this operation. This is missing, that is missing. The audio meter calibration is out of whack, so nobody gets tested for a day. That takes three weeks to get it calibrated. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, we don't have backup equipment. Uh, so these are some of the things that we are currently focused on before we get into that scaling type of uh, 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 opportunity. The last slide uh, showed you a picture of Dr. Allen, who is currently past president, but currently leading this effort. Um, I have a trip planned for the end of this year to go and uh, hopefully uh, have some uh, local entrepreneurs funding some ear uh, hearing aids. Uh, planning to go there and perhaps get more updates and come back with a report for our rotary. That's all I have. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be glad to uh, address them today. Thank you, Angelo. That was very good. And like I said, we do have a grant in. We'll know at the end of August as to what the total is. I know that uh, Angelo and some of the people from TI are going to help fund this. 
So that's a great opportunity to spread the word about Rotary and what we're doing. Uh, so if, are there any questions from the audience? Bill, I see your lips are starting to move. Not say anything. Just look moving. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so what I would like to do is invite Dr. Jackie Clark and have her connect the dots with her global uh, uh, activities. She just came back from South Africa and perhaps have her give some opinion on some of these and how we could improve and we can learn from her. Okay. And some of her certification program that could be funded. Okay. So. Now, Dr. Clark is, was here before. She is a professor at the uh, University of Texas, uh, Dallas. And uh, she's also with the Calier Theory Center, just not across the way from us here. So uh, we do appreciate you very much. And now we're going to have Darren Collins, he's been in Nairobi, Kenya, doing his project and the uh, hand up, uh, doing the uh, education on HIV AIDS. And he's been doing this now for over a year, and he's home here for about a month, and he is making his round. So uh, he's getting his presentation lined up. Uh, if there are any questions or anything, any comments? Um, Please feel free to shout. And there's Bill's artwork in his office. It's <laughs> whatever that is. Whatever that is. We still haven't figured it out. It's a painting. But y'all look and sound good online, by the way. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, bye bye. bye, -bye. Talk to me later. Okay, Darren. So can you hear me right now? Everyone can hear me right now? Or does it go to the actual computer audio? That's what I don't know. Chris, Chris you can so hear, you hear me. Hey, if I push play on this video, will you also hear the video? You should. Play it loud, we can hear anything in the room. Oh, you play in the room, I see. Okay. So we volume. So uh, what I'd like to do right now is actually just play for you a little promo video that we made. Uh, I feel like maybe this club has already seen this one because uh, we made it earlier in the year. I feel like I was here earlier in the year. They've probably forgotten. Probably forgotten by now. <laughs> but uh, just to give you a quick uh, introduction, basically what happened is about a, a couple of years ago, we began the process of putting together a $137,000 grant to do a quite a large scale. Uh, go our goal was to reach 20,000 children and a few other things, uh, tra training a variety of people with HIV and AIDS prevention education. And in that process, we uh, it was quite a process. And so right now, I'm at the point where it's just about over. The grant is money is just about done being spent. But we're looking for a way forward in a way that keeps it sustainable beyond the actual length of the grant. Uh, generally speaking, Rotary would expect that to be written into the grant. And we did have sustainability partners written into the grant. But what we couldn't have anticipated was when we arrived in Kenya, between the time that we applied for the grant and set up cooperating organizations and the time we began to execute, our cooperating organization fell apart. It wasn't their own fault necessarily, uh, just a time and bad luck and also a, uh, a landlord who took over their building and leased it out to someone else. So there was no place to make puppets, there was no place to rehearse, there was no place to, to have a central uh, location in the city that we expected. Those are the people who were going to take it on beyond the scope of the grant. They were unable to do so. So now I find myself in a unique and in a position that I am glad to be in, where I'm also trying to help our cooperating organization reach sustainability. Not just the project, but also the project partners who have been struggling so much since the time that we began that grant process. Uh, so the good news is we have uh, we have made some progress, and here's just a quick little video to show you what that progress looks like. Oh, we got 
So guys, uh, the upshot was is that at this point, um, our goal was 20,000 uh, children to meet. Now, I, that was not my original goal. I originally anticipated reaching 10,000 people. But we sat down with the district governor of uh, 9212, and he said, that's not good enough. <laughs> he says, if you're going to spend this kind of money, I want you to reach at least double that. And so we doubled it. And I think that was ambitious, but we have. At this point in time, we have reached uh, about 21,800 pupils with this HIV and AIDS prevention education. And of course, in the first 11 weeks of launch, we reached 17,800. And that's, that's an amazing number, but that shows the scope of how this kind of concept can work. Basically, we're doing school assemblies. It only takes three performers, and then when these three performers get in there, they are then able to, to do a 65-minute presentation and teach all the dirty details about the things that the appropriate age group needs to know about the HIV and AIDS prevention education message. So in that way, it worked really well, and I'm quite proud of the fact that we've done that. Now, we still have about $5,000 left in this grant, and if I'm very careful with it, we're going to be able to produce a public service announcement and do three more training events to teach other people how to replicate this program. Because the whole idea, what we did is we actually, in this process, I don't know if you guys know, but what we did is we, I, I collected the information over several years and a lot of time. Uh, in anticipation of doing something like this. And, and as the grant, before the grant even began, I had been collecting data from, uh, from doctors and from nurses and from uh, children's workers and, and Sunday school teachers and pastors and parents and people who were were who affected by this particular issue and just as much as I could, learning what I could, even going to hospitals and various classes about HIV and AIDS here in Dallas. And then from there, I took all that information, I gave it over once the grant was, was, was acquired, I gave it over to the guys who are responsible for the Mobile Crime Dog Program, the guys who wrote all of that graded curriculum for the National Crime Prevention Council back in the 80s. They're really good at teaching kids stuff using the performing arts. So once they, all those writers took that together, and then they, they put together this really great package of information uh, taught in a way that, that would be used. But then I took all that information and sent it over to Hollywood. And the guy who wrote The Secret Life of Pets, the guy who wrote the Minions movie, he was like a script doctor. He made it really, really funny. He twisted here, turned there, tightened here, and just made the scripts to the Hollywood uh, sort of quality of, of, uh, of a program. Then I sent it over to Nairobi, and the guys who are the head writers for the number one and number two comedy shows in East Africa were the ones who actually um, uh, did all the script editing into Swahili and a translation. So we have a really nice team of people working together. 
Uh, looks like we lost lost Chris. Is he just leave or people leaving? Um, so what's happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 See him eating there? He's chomping. <laughs> okay, good, good to know. And so, so that was the initial pr process. But then, um, of course, we have seen the success. It really has been incredible. But it has not all been success. And so, let me, let me also. I think one of the important things when working in the third world, which is, I believe is an antiquated term. That term doesn't actually exist anymore. It's not relevant in today's society. But we all know what we mean. When we Say third world. Um, there, there. It's a bit of a mercy playground. Companies go there, organizations go there to spend money that isn't theirs on a project that they believe is important, and it behooves them to not report negative evidence, to not show what goes wrong, because then they might lose their funding. But I believe the integrity of Rotary is a little bit different, where it's okay to say, "Hey, here's where I messed up." First thing I messed up on was, I've never been a team leader. You know, I, I, I realize in my entrepreneurial life, I have all my ducks in a row. I set things up so I could volunteer for a year. Um, I did not anticipate my house falling apart, you know, the, the roof uh, uh, having to be replaced, the foundation having to be replaced, uh, the front and back decks having to be replaced, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the renter <laughs> destroying the place and costing me 15 grand of things that I had to deal with in the jungle on the phone at 1 a.m. in the morning talking to banks when I hear roaring I've got to step over here to get signal you know and dealing with baboons and all that sort of thing and that was tricky as it, as it is as you can imagine but also I've never I've always been a solo guy I've always been a solo entrepreneur so running a group of 10 people was like whoa the challenges of management is crazy but I think the hardest thing is that the very first day and we finally assembled the teams, got them together, and said, here's our orientation meeting. We met at a Rotarian's house, and we had lunch, and I said, you know, we have some time. Everyone go swim in the pool. And, um, and Helen, our lead puppeteer, drowned in the pool. And I tried uh, CPR, and I failed. And I, um, I tried. Uh, it, she was the rock and foundation of the group. She was the girl who wrangled all the boys and kept them on track. She was the one who would be my liaison if I was to have trouble management-wise. She would handle it, and she was suddenly gone. And of course, the police were tricky. They they wanted to arrest me for burying her too soon. You know, of course, it's not my decision, but of course, I was the guy on site. I'm the responsible party for hiring this person. And I'm thinking, what ramifications do I have as a Rotarian as being responsible for this life? I spent the next month not doing the project, but going to memorials. Uh, going to funerals, to liaison with the family, and you know, funeral planning, and all this sort of thing, completely out of the scope of the project, but obviously very, very important. And everyone working there loved her very dearly. But unfortunately, that wasn't the last. Um, up until today, um, since that last thing that happened on June 9th, um, seven more of my friends have died. Mm -hmm. And um, just all different circumstances. Um, two of them were my host parents that were there in Kenya for the last few years of doing the research. Their whole family was in a car accident and passed away. And so I, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I was not a great boss. I don't think I was a great project manager. But we accomplished what we set out to accomplish in terms of the shows, and the education did take place, but it was rough. It was, it was ugly along the way, because also the house stuff I was dealing with back in the United States. And, uh, it was also tricky. I, I broke my ankle and my foot. Uh, it looked wonderful. My friend, it was a fracture. It was a break. Uh, it healed all by itself with the cast. Uh, the good news is in Kenya, um, they have great doctors and they're not expensive. So I still do walk with a limp, and that's been tricky. But in that process, also, there was uh, cars broke down, and there were people who. Um, um, you're uh, always trying to get arrested for one reason or another. Yeah, I have a lot of great <laughs> video of me haggling with police for you know a good 45 minutes because I refuse to pay a bribe. And so I just show my rotary <laughs> pen and say, I, I can't pay a bribe. And they don't know what it means, and it doesn't really mean anything in terms of a bribe, <laughs> except for uh, the ethics of the four-way test. <laughs> and I don't think it's appropriate. So I do have a lot of great video of, of me discussing the ethics of bribery with police late at night as I'm trying to go home. <laughs> So uh, that's also, uh, the police actually showed up our office, uh, just coincidence. I didn't really tell anyone online because my mom would be worried. Um, but after we left, they were shooting some kidnappers and they just sprayed through the windows of our office. I'm glad no one was there. Generally, people were there all night long because one of the things they did is I had all this equipment to produce all this mm -hmm. stuff. But I thought, what is the use of having all this equipment if people can't use it 24-7? I can accomplish the goal of the grant, but there's still stuff 
it should be used. So I have a bunch of other young professionals who are just trying to make their way in Kenya. And I've written them into the grant as part of the structure that someone always gets to use the grant. So even right now, I can get notifications on my phone. I can show you pictures. There are people in that office right now using the rotary purchase uh, uh, computers to just do their own project, just trying to make it in the business of media there in Nairobi. Um, thanks to it. Otherwise, it would never be possible for, for, for this equipment. So there's a lot of good stuff happening as well. Um, and the great part is we have attention of a lot of organizations. I mean, the Ministry of Health is, is yes, do what we do. The Ministry of Education um, is about to give approval as well, which would mean that the schools will have to invite us. The Ministry of Education signs on. That means we, we, if we knock on the school door, the doors have to be open. Now, do they pay you then when you go in the ministry? It's, it's, possi do, it's possible like to be donation? paid. The schools can pay sometimes, but they don't know what it is right now. Okay. So to say, hey, we're going to do a puppet show, you guys got to pay, they're like, eh, not really. But since Rotary has already put in the bill, I can just right. go in and just, just do it. You know what I'm saying? But as as this, as, a, as we look for sustainability, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. There, there's, there's more, there's schools that have more money that absolutely can easily pay on a fee. Now, and part of that process also, uh, I have figured out how much it really does cost. Uh, it's eighty-five dollars for us to go to a school. That's the biscuit. Pay my puppeteers, pay for fuel, and give them a meal, and get them out there and doing a presentation. Now, that's a pretty low number, especially when some, yeah. some schools can have fifteen hundred kids. So, so that is incredible. So, what I would like to have is individuals. I'd like to find individuals and clubs who would be willing to do like a recurring payment, eighty-five dollars a month, just so I know that my puppeteers at least one day will get to go to a school, and so I can keep them working. Because right, right now, what I don't want to is have these highly trained puppeteers that are very, are very good and they're passionate. You know, it's one thing to find an artist a job. It's another thing to give an artist a job that they want to keep. But because HIV and AIDS uh, cut so deep in everyone's families, it's quite easy for them to find passion also in this artistic endeavor. So, but I gotta keep them working. I gotta keep them working five days a week or I'm gonna lose them to something else. And so what I'm hoping is that concerned Rotarians will, uh, or clubs, will decide, yeah, we'll do a, a a monthly debit for eighty-five dollars. If I get thirty of those, then I know at least my very baseline I keep my employees, and they can, and then from there they can begin to develop other relationships. For instance, Doctors Without Borders has just contacted us. They're going to begin contracting us in January to do a similar program. It's not HIV and AIDS, but it's gender-based uh, violence, which they're very passionate about, and they're dealing with that. And so we've already had a relationship with Doctors Without Borders. Uh, another uh, program, uh, our puppeteers are preparing today, right now, they're actually in the rehearsal room over in Nairobi, I think, we'll be there in a couple hours. <laughs> they are uh, presenting for the First Lady of Kenya, because a child safety uh, digital platform has la is launching to help keep track of kids so that, uh, to reduce the risk of kidnapping and other issues. And they saw our program and said, we want you guys involved in the launches when we do live education, and so, on the 27th, we're actually going to perform for about 3,000 children or something like that and teaching about what to do if you get lost. Okay. Memorize your parents' phone number, go find a policeman, give them a call. All that. I, I've been writing and giving them magic tricks that they can do to illustrate that. And the first lady will, will see us. And it will be the third time we've run into the first lady. <laughs> so well, all of this is very interesting. I know we could you could go on for days. I could. I could. And, uh, but if you really want to keep up with Darren, go to Facebook. He posts something usually every day, he gives us some of his adventures with the, the lemurs, the whatever animals, <laughs> yeah, the right. anyway, lions, baboons, baboons yeah. leopards. leopards, elephants, whatever. Uh, it's sort of an open concept of living, yeah. not really a closed doors, and he never <laughs> yeah. knows what's going to come in. And so don't ask him to do something at 1 o'clock in the morning on his uh, oh, phone, oh, because the lions are out at that time of night. Yeah. So we don't want to lose him. So we thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you being here. And you're going to be here for another a month. Twenty-seven said? more days. Twenty-seven more days. Yes. So uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come here. Does anyone have any questions? We're taking questions. If you have any, any, any interest, yeah. so just one here. Okay. <laughs> but this has been an ongoing project, and I do see his Facebook post every day. He hasn't been posting lately since he's been <clears> over here. There's nothing exciting <coughs> when he's yeah, here. Sure. <laughs> so, so, are your puppeteers uh, 
doing it both in English and Swahili? Or yeah, the video, the video you saw was English because that's the parts of the show that I pulled out just right. for this. But no, it's actually a mix. The way people <clears> speak <throat> over there tends to be Swahili English mix. Okay. And so, yeah, now they, they're not everyone's perfect Swahili or perfect English. That's why the, the voices are pre recorded with professional radio DJs. That's the next, my, next question. Are those pre recorded voices they do the puppeting? That's right, sense. because otherwise they'd have microphones on and they'd be dealing with that yeah. and trying to keep the script perfect. Whereas yeah. I don't want any mission drift or any message drift. I can control that by having them just lip sync. Yeah. It's a nice little thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. one final reminder. <clears throat> uh, Y'all should have gotten your invoices for the dues. So oh, yeah. please get those in. I know he says by the 27th or 29th, but RI says they're due upon receipt, so we need to get our dues in to RI. So if you have any, bring it to the next meeting, mail them over here to Bill's office, put E Club uh, North Texas on the envelope so they'll know it's for us. And uh, at this time, I will close the meeting if, with the four way test. So if you all join me, stand up. <laughs> oh, you take it. Okay, sorry, we had to wait for them. Yeah. Okay, the four-way test and the things we think they or do. First, is it the truth? truth? Second, is it fair and all of us? Third, will it build good will and better, better friendships? And fourth, will it be better than all of us? Thank you. Bye. Uh, we got some more parts or a lead on some more parts for uh, Paul's.